few miles from the imperial city of Delhi stands the celebrated Tower of Victory, one of India's architectural wonders, commemorating the victory of Mohammedan over Hindu civilization. It is made of red sandstone and it has been standing in this remarkable state of preservation for over 700 years. The story of Mohammedanism in India is picturesquely revealed in the numerous mosques and temples which dot the land, one of the most noted of which is that of Safan Jang, a Mohammedan general who distinguished himself in the conflict between Mohammedanism and Hinduism. His tomb is patterned after the famous Taj Mahal, which is regarded as the world's most celebrated Mohammedan shrine. Following the path of the Mohammedan conquerors, we arrive in Delhi, and the conspicuous landmark which first attracts our attention is the Cathedral Mosque, often referred to as the Friday Mosque, built about three centuries ago by the great Mohammedan emperor, Shah Jahan. No country in the world has so completely woven its destiny in the threads of religion as has India, where Mohammedans and Hindus alike determine their way of life by their respective creeds. They resort to their temples as the focal point around which their religious as well as social life function. And so sensitive is the thread between these two great creeds that a false gesture on either side is enough to create an uprising. For example, if a Mohammedan should intentionally belittle a sacred cow, or if a Hindu should drive a pig into a Mohammedan temple, a riot might follow. For Hindus worship sacred cows, and Mohammedans abhor pigs. We are now on Chandni Chalk, or Silver Street, which was once regarded as the richest street in the world because of the priceless treasures found in the exclusive shops that flank its sidewalks. In modern times, however, Chandni Chalk has lost much of its glamour. But in the so-called Ivory Palace, we may find examples of craftsmanship that brought world fame to Chandni Chalk. Ivory carving, one of India's traditional arts, has been handed down from father to son from time immemorial, and it is reasonably assumed that no small amount of the most famous examples of ivory carving in the world today originated here. This is an ivory tusk out of which a dozen small elephants have been carved, one of the supreme achievements of ivory carving. On this single tusk has been carved a pictorial story of the reign of a Maharaja, just as the ancient Egyptians carved inscriptions on their temples. The durability of ivory is greater than that of stone, and consequently these carvings may last for thousands of years. Perhaps the costliest treasure to be found here is this famous ivory screen, over which an artist is said to have labored for 20 years before it was completed. No picture can do justice to the delicate carving in this masterpiece, into which about 30 choice elephant tusks have been transformed so neatly that even with a magnifying glass, it is impossible to discern where one piece ends and the other begins. And here is the man who says he gave 20 years of his life to this masterpiece. Ivory furniture is so precious and delicate that it takes considerable courage for an Occidental visitor to use it for the purpose it was intended, but it is really more sturdy than it looks. Out in the streets of Delhi, we are just in time to witness a typical wedding procession. Although the bride and groom may not be seen, their household gifts are carried in the parade. In other words, the more fortunate married couples in India merely need to open their future home on their wedding day and let their relatives and friends march in with the furniture and other household requirements, including the all-important baby carriage. And now we come to what might be considered the most important structure in modern India, the capital at New Delhi where the British Viceroy presides as the chief representative of the crown in all of India. 
The arrival of the Viceroy at a horse and cattle show in Delhi is a most impressive sight, and it is a colorful reminder of the pomp and circumstance of old England, vying with the proverbial pageantry of ancient India. the thrill of the Viceroy's arrival is over, the show goes on, featuring India's finest cattle and horses. with the horses are the blue ribbon bullocks, representing the farming districts of central India. Less fortunate than the prize cattle are the ones that have been reduced to hard labor for which horses are seldom used in India. All over India, the streets are thronged with bullocks, and an automobile in their presence is as foreign as cattle would be in the main streets of our Occidental cities. The sacred bullock, however, has an easy time of it, mingling freely with the population and living off the fat of the land a land that has witnessed a pageantry of life unparalleled by any other country, a land in which Hindus and Mohammedans have had their day of rule, finally surrendering to the British Christians, a few thousands of whom now have the responsibility of ruling a fifth of the human race. Truly, this is a great tribute to Great Britain's statesmanship as well as her universal sense of law and order.